this second part, I will introduce and describe what is the one important thing that usually we forget. We are researchers and we want to develop some innovation. What is very important is actually to know what we mean by research and what we mean by innovation. We saw in the first model that there's no logical connection between research and innovation. If we want to see and define what research is about, we can agree on some different outcomes of research. The first one is knowledge. Research is carried out to expand the domain of knowledge. Another feature of research is what we can call expertise. That means through the expertise, we learn how to do things, or we learn how to do better, or we learn how to analyze things in a better way. We have as the third outcome of research, what we can call discovery. Through research, people can discover things. And finally, we can say that one of the results of research can be the invention. We invent things. When we look at this, Actually, you see that out of the four main results of research, we don't have innovation. So when we say that maybe innovation is a benchmark of research, this is not really obvious. And what we must do first is to see what is the relationship between research and innovation. Why are we doing this natural connection and claiming that research will lead to innovation. We can understand that when we look at different outcomes of research, like a discovery, like invention, and we compare them to innovation. Actually, the three topics share a same feature, and this feature is the novelty. All of them can be, when they exist, can be described as new. They didn't exist before. And because of a common factor is novelty, we tend to believe that invention, discovery, and innovation share some link. And we tend to believe that the natural evolution of invention or discovery is innovation. And this is why we will always claim that when we invent something new, when we discover something new, this is what we call now innovation. But actually, when we compare discovery, invention, and innovation, not only there's not a line between them, but there's a fundamental difference. And the fundamental difference is about the timeline required to develop discovery. When you discover something in average, when you produce something that will come to the market, it can take up to 20 years. An example is the new molecules that can be used in pharmaceutical application. It will take 17 years actually to come to market between the first synthesis and the final approval. Invention, when you invent something, a new machine, actually will take in average 10 years. But for innovation, what people expect that when we claim that we have some innovative project and we want to develop it, the expected time frame from the initial idea to the market is actually three years. So there's a major difference between these discovery, invention, and innovation. Not only they're not directly connected, but also the time frame for the development is significantly different. Let's look at one example, a successful example of research discovery that led to innovation, and there are the LEDs. If we look at the time frame for the development of LEDs, we can say that in 1927, the first LED was reported by a Russian scientist, Oleg Ozev. Between 1927 to 1960, there were some work, but it was really a, a small interest about this solid that could emit some light when they were excited by some electrical field. And in 1962, the first commercial LED was produced by Texas Instruments. But these LEDs were very expensive. We have to wait 
until 1994 to see the production of the first high intensity LEDs. And finally, in the 2000s, the technology for large scale manufacturing became mature. There's a clear advantage of LEDs compared with light bubble. They are inexpensive, now they are inexpensive, and they can emit different type of wavelength, different colors. If we compare the evolution of LEDs, the price and the market, we have on this graph the price per kilolumen, how much it costs to produce a given amount of light. Between 2008 and 2014, we see that the price is drastically reducing. 2008 is actually yesterday. In parallel, the amount of installation using LEDs grew in a very, very impressive way. Till the same, we can say that 2008, it's just a niche market. It really started to rise in 2010, and in 2014, you had uh, more than 70 million of LEDs being installed. So it appears now that LEDs have been a real and true game changer in lighting devices and probably one of the main contributors to reduce energy cost. Now, if we compare this technology and market evolution of LEDs, and we compare it with the number of publications, so they are the footprint of the uh, scientific work on LEDs. Surprisingly, when we look at the graph here that summarize all the papers being published with LEDs in the title until 1970, there were clearly only 19 papers from 1930. But of course, there were some other papers probably dealing with the phenomenon. This means that it was almost zero. In the 70s, less than 300 papers. In the 80s, still the same, very stable. In the 90s, between 90 and 99, you have 1,600 pa papers, which is the worldwide production. It's, it's nothing for the domain that became so important. And we see the number actually rising since 2000. And between 2000 and 2009, we have like 7,000 papers. Between 2010 and 2017, we have more than 10,000 papers. So what we see and when we remember that the actual market really started in 2008, 2010, we can see that there were not really a significant academic work the academic research was not ahead of the industrial development. And probably we could explain the fact that the number of papers expanded totally in parallel with the actual market of LEDs and not before by the fact that funding agencies and companies decided because they were already working and developing and selling LEDs to support academic research in this domain. It means that the actual innovation of LEDs was not the result of some academic research that came before and then brought results that led to real innovation. Innovation was made in parallel of research. And when we look at that and we compare the tremendous success of LEDs, and we saw in the first model the example of some materials, the mesoporous silica, where people have been working on them for 20 years and a lot of work, a lot of papers being published, a lot of money being spent, and apparently no application, I mean, no real, no real or not large-scale application. The question we could have to try to understand what happened is why LEDs have been such a successful innovation, why mesoporous materials, for example, were not. We can find an easy answer if we look at this picture by Klaus Bergen. My team has created a very innovative solution, but we're still looking for a problem to go with it. And this is what we want to avoid, and this is what usually has academic researchers we tend to do. We focus on developing solution, and then when we have something new, when we discover something, when we have a new invention, we call it an innovation. We have the solution and we say, okay, we have a solution. Do you have a problem that could fit with it? And this is one of the things we forget. The fact that 
If we start with a solution, it will be like building the key without the lock of the door. This is what we must remember, that the solution we can develop in our lab can be totally disconnected and we can come with a key, beautiful key, but the problem is this key is opening no lock, no door. And we can say that one of the biggest traps for entrepreneur, or I could say a researcher, is that they are overly attached to the idea or their solution, but they don't know if their solution solves a real problem. And if you think about the type of research and development you can do and when you try to, to come with what we call innovation, you will discover that most of the activity of researchers in what they call innovation, it's to work on improving the solution, even if they don't know if this solution solves the real problem. And most of the activity will be to still work on doing a better solution, improve the material, improve the system, improve everything. But something they don't do is just try to figure out if there's a real problem, and we'll define what is a real problem, if there's a real problem that could fit with their current solution. Also, we have this tendency to focus on our activity on our solution. And there's a other quote who said, when you have already decided to build a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. And you will fake the problem, you will fit the problem on the canvas of your so solution to justify your solution. So you come with your solution and you figure out and you imagine that everybody has a problem and that your solution could help solve this problem. The result is that you don't understand why when you explain what is your solution, how brilliant is your solution, you don't understand why the people don't run to you and say, I want it, I want it. The company are not running to you, giving money to, for you to buy the license, to buy the right to use it. And you don't see it because from your point of view, as a researcher, as let's call it the innovator, you see that your innovation, your solution can solve a lot of problems because you see this problem from your own point of view. And now you have this solution, you discover something, you invented something, and you say you call it innovation. But what we can begin to feel now is that innovation actually it's not about commercializing novelty. It's not about bringing something new, whatever it is, to the market, to try to convince companies to pay for it, to try to convince people to buy it. So if innovation is not about commercializing novelty, maybe we could say that innovation is about solving a real problem. And that will introduce a change in paradigm. Innovation is about solving a real problem. Of course, at this point, you could say, yes, but what is a real problem? We can find a simple definition for the real problem that will help us actually to identify what are the real problems and what are the unreal problem. And the real problem is when people are happy if a solution exists. So simple. If we can figure out that there are people, there's a, a given group of people, a given industry, given type of users, and these users, if a solution existed, we, we don't even say that there's a, already a solution. If a solution existed to a given problem, that's a real problem, and we can presume that these people would be more than happy to pay for the solution. And that changed totally what we are talking about. Now, it means that what we have is a change in the way we see the connection between the research and innovation. We concluded that the innovation is not the natural outcome of research. And we must start from another point of view. And what we must do is to start not from the solution we developed, not from the key we made, but from the problem. And we can define what I call the innovation triangle. Now, we identify a problem. And the next step will be to find users, potential customers, people who will say that, yes, they will agree, yes, they have this problem. 
And this is a combination of the problem and users who will define what we call the real problem. It means if you cannot find people who would be happy with the solution, you had a brilliant idea, you believe it's a problem, but this problem will not need an innovation because nobody will need a solution. And when you have identified the problem and the users, then you can work on the solution. And you can create a solution. And what is very important here, you see that the solution is not to this problem, but the problem and users. For the same problem, if you have different type of users, you could have to develop different type of solutions. So the solution is not something which is totally disconnected from the real life, but is the solution that will make some people happy because this solution it's fixing the problem for those people. And when you have created a solution, this solution will offer some functions, which we will define later on. And what is important is that this function belongs to the solution. The, this function belongs to the researcher, to the innovator. But we want to make users happy. And the users, they don't mind about the function of the system. What they want is to get a value if they use the solution. And the challenge will be actually to start with a problem, but to find a good fit between the values that the users are expecting and the function that we will create for the solution. And of course, when we are in this process, we will have to assess our solution against competition to see if our functions are contributing to improve the value that the users, the customers, will get if they decide to use our solution. Another way to describe it from the more business point of view by Ash Moria, again, is actually what he called the innovation trinity. It's quite similar. You still have a triangle. If your solution is desirable, do customers want it? Do they want the solution you offer? Is it feasible? Can you build it? And is it viable? Can you make money out of it? The innovation trinity will be actually at the intersection of these three areas.